Welcome everyone. This is JSA TV, the newsroom for tech and telecom professionals. And JSA Radio, the voice for tech and telecom on iHeartRadio. I'm Jamie Scott Ukutaya of JSA, and on behalf of my team here at JSA, welcome to our monthly virtual CEO roundtable. These virtual roundtables lead us up to our on-site CEO roundtables at our C-Level networking event, the Telecom Exchange. Next one up, June 20th in Hoboken, New Jersey at the W Hotel. And just announced, Telecom Exchange LA. That's November 7th, Beverly Hills. More info on both events at thetelecomexchange.com. Today's roundtable is brought to you by our video platform provider, Pinnica. So our panelists are able to stream in live video feeds from all across the world today, which is exciting. So thank you, Pinnica, and thank you to our viewers joining us live and on demand. All right, well, let's get started. Today's topic, and traditionally uh, what we find for the past few years, our most viewed roundtable of the year, no pressure panelists, predictions for transformative technology in 2018 and its impact on networks. We have a C-level lineup that we're really excited about, three absolutely innovative companies, uh, their thought leaders joining us today. And here to help us break it down, I'm very proud to introduce my friend, editor and creator of the industry's very top blog, Telecom Ramblings, Mr. Rob Powell. Rob, thanks so much for returning each year to be our guest moderator and kick off our roundtable series with us on this predictions roundtable. I should also add, if I may, that personally, I look forward to your own predictions and reports on the uh, industry in, in your Telecom Ramblings blog as well. So thank you for joining us as our star guest moderator, and please do us the honors of introducing our panelists. I am honored to introduce our all-star panelists. I will kick off with uh, Cliff Kane. He's the CEO of Clarion. Clarion is addressing the evolving access market by providing carrier neutral dark fiber lit services hoteling and service assurance to meet the demands of 5G, IoT, and densification. Uh, next up is uh, Mark Abalapia. Uh, he's the COO of DataVision. It's an SDN, networking and technology consulting company. And rounding out the panel is Michael Quinn, the founding partner of Q Advisors. Uh, Q Advisors is a world-class boutique global investment banking uh, bank serving uh, public and private companies, PAE firms, entrepreneurs, and large multinationals in the telecom and media and tech space. Gentlemen, thank you for joining us and bringing your unique perspectives to the topic of new technology predictions and their, uh, their impact on networks. Set the stage for us. Tell us a little bit about your business model and what happened that really set the tone last year. And what do you see as the critical threads to remember for 2018? Cliff? Sure, and uh, thank you for having me. Uh, it's always good to uh, to uh, get a forum to discuss the, these types of uh, uh, progress in the marketplace. So for 2017, um, what we've been doing is cobbling together the uh, foundational components to be able to address these this upcoming uh, groundswell of market opportunity through densification, IoT, and, and 5G. Um, we have keenly uh, tracking the access market and because that's one of our primary lines of business, which is as a carrier's carrier, we provide access services in the New York uh, uh, metro area. Uh, and we've been putting together um, uh, some co-location facilities as well. We've acquired some data center operations in this area and uh, you know, all of this to, um, to, to be able to provide a, a, a comprehensive uh, suite of solutions uh, for access and and you know in terms of um, you know going into this year into throughout 2018 I think we're going to see that that shift in the access market because uh, we believe that's becoming bi-directional in that um, access is going to go two ways I mean traditionally in the access markets the, the telecoms call it that because they were accessing uh, their their customers are, are reaching to access the the local loop or the end end user uh, at this point, it's going to go uh, bi-directional. It'll, it'll be inclusive of the, the end users, which will kind of shift from, in our market at least, because we're, we're strictly B2B, uh, it will shift from uh, these the actual uh, uh, business to uh, the actual uh, end user in that business uh, with, with 5G once that rolls around. We're not there yet, uh, but that's what we're preparing for. Great. Mark? 
Thanks, Rob. Great to be here, by the way. Um, so with respect to Data Vision's business uh, and the overall industry, uh, we spent most of 2017 executing on uh, the previous year's work with respect to understanding what our telco clients need from a uh, orchestration and automation perspective for uh, making their operations more efficient and incorporating the new SDN technology into uh, their networks. So uh, from, from a skills perspective, We've spent time in hiring and training and being involved in things like Metro Ethernet Forum, uh, Open Network Access Platform, uh, ONAP, which uh, is an outgrowth of a couple of other different open source projects. But for the most part, what we did throughout 2017 is see our customers uh, realize a lot of these uh, network control systems. So we've worked on a lot of integration. Uh, we've, so, we've seen uh, a lot of adoption of network functions virtualization uh, and all the integration work that uh, comes with that, uh, working through all the problems to operationalize all this you know, whiz-bang technology that's come out the last couple of years. And moving forward in 2018, uh, we see, number one, a lot more of that but number two, uh, with respect to some of the 5G technologies coming out, um, there's the edge computing paradigm and a number of other uh, related technologies that we think will emerge um, in 2018. So those are the things that um, we think are going to build on last year's uh, activity with respect to software-defined networking and you know, particularly our business and pulling all those things together. Hmm, thanks. Mike? Michael? Yeah, from a, a bit of a different perspective, being an investment bank, but we, in 2017, we saw uh, our clients doing a number of different things. First is the ubiquitous rollout of SD-WAN, whether they're a traditional telco fiber company, the idea to get a reach uh, that is broader on a better and more efficient CapEx perspective. The second thing we saw uh, with our clients pretty much outside the U.S., particularly in Mexico, where we did a billion-dollar raise for the Morgan Stanley Infrastructure Group to, to start the new wireless network, is that uh, in emerging markets like Mexico and other places, they're leapfrogging 4G to start rolling out immediate 5G networks. And I think we're going to see that as well. And finally, what we're seeing is uh, in the IoT space, this, uh, and I think Mark just mentioned that the desire and need for edge computing uh, to, to keep that data more localized. And I think we're going to see a lot more of that this year from our clients as well. Great. Uh, in 2017, we certainly started, started to see carriers make big moves to prepare for 5G. Where are we in that ramp? Are those preparations themselves changing the landscape already, or is that something we can look forward to this year? What we're seeing is RFPs for densification from the, uh, the wireless carriers uh, we're seeing CRAN uh, specifically uh, mentioned and, 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 and brought into the, uh, um, the design of those, um, you know, those networks that they're looking to acquire. Uh, so, you know, we're, I think we're, we're away, away from uh, delivering 5G, but um, uh, it is, it's certainly ramping up. There's real uh, deals happening in, in our market for this where, you know, there's uh, – there's been thousands, literally thousands, of uh, small cell uh, fiber uh, uh, sites awarded to uh, some of the local competitors of, of mine. Uh, so it's it's ramping up. Uh, the carriers who, you know, and the 5G carriers or the, the wireless carriers that we speak to, uh, which is all of them, that you know they're all um, you know, they're all uh, engaged in that conversation. Uh, there's there's no question about it. And the other aspect of it is that we're we're looking to uh, provide in-building wireless services with uh, with wireline uh, connectivity as well, uh, and that that discussion's got a lot of traction lately. So, you know, 2018 you know, it'll still be more of a uh, a building up year before we we start seeing uh, these real rollouts. But everybody's prepping for it for sure. Mark. Yeah, so um, building on what Cliff was mentioning, absolutely. You know, there's a lot of preparation. They're definitely building on it for you know next year and, and moving forward. Um, you know, there's a lot of activity with respect to trials. I'm sure folks have read about you know what Verizon did at the Super Bowl with trying to do a uh, you know a very small localized area with you know 70, 80, 90 thousand people all pumping uh, data into the network, as well as some of the uh, virtual reality uh, trials and other little uh, you know hands-on. Uh, toys that they were trying to, to do there. So um, there's, you know, a lot of trial work. There's a lot of experimentation. Um, 
a couple of weeks ago down in Miami at Metro Connect, uh, one of the wireless carriers there was talking about how everything they build with respect to LTE radios now has, you know, a piece of, uh, you know, 5G in it as well. So they literally have to, you know, do minor modifications, flipping a switch, et cetera, to, you know, move the network from where they are to true 5G. So there's, you know, lots of preparation for it. Uh, folks are definitely looking ahead. Uh, and again, just to go back to the uh, edge compute paradigm, as folks realize that, you know, all this computing power is necessary at the edge, you're going to see uh, a lot of different companies emerge, uh, you know, companies like Seaplane AI, and there's another one that's working with, uh, I think it's uh, Crown, uh, that does this uh, mini data center uh, type of situation. Um, I think it's called Volutus, Project Volutus, or something along those lines. But you're going to see a lot more of these types of hardware and software combinations emerge in order to address that need. So from where where data vision sits in that whole world versus where Cliff sits, um, you know, once he runs his fiber and builds infrastructure, our intelligence sits at the edge or even at the center of that network to coordinate all that application activity and therefore drive um, the adoption of, you know, 5G and all the applications around it. Hmm. Michael? Yeah, I, I agree with the other panelists. I mean, I think 18 is a planning year. And you look at 16 and 17, you had the tower companies aggressively buying fiber companies. The reason is for small cell deployment for the 5G rollout that's going to happen. Um, and in 17, you saw an acceleration of by both fiber companies as well as wireless and traditional landline companies buying fixed wireless companies to use the fixed wireless spectrum for backhaul for eventual 5G rollout. So I see our fiber clients uh, getting primed for more uh, small cell deployment as well as distributed antenna and DAS uh, deployments as, as Cliff mentioned in building and I think 18 is a planning year uh, by by the end of 19 you're really going to see significant rollout. Switching gears wh where is the Internet of Things in its evolution right now and how, how do you think we should be thinking of it in 2018 is that is that one phenomenon or is it, is it many separate ones or you many separate types of things? Uh, uh, so, you know, for us, we're we're really just trying to provide the the plumbing and housing for IoT applications, not knowing really. Um, I, I think it's so nascent that it, it's really hard to project uh, what's going to be needed in specifically in our metro. I mean, there's, there's a lot of stuff gets talked about, and uh, from you know driverless cars to uh, you know to uh, you know street lights and controls, and it, I think. All of these things are, are great, but we're really not focused on the application level, but more the, the infrastructure level, it's just to enable those things to, 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 to work and play together. Right. So with respect to IoT, um, you know, as Cliff alluded to, it's, you know, very early days uh, in most of uh, the applications that people have talked about with respect to the cars and the smart cities and all the rest of it. Um, however, there is one area that I think it's much further along and uh, the things being, you know, large scale industrial machinery, um, you know, things like uh, aircraft engines, uh, you know, sending telemetry and, you know, the, and the like. But from a, uh, you know, a terrestrial network perspective and, you know, the business that you know we're mostly involved in again it's uh you know, building out the infrastructure, uh, making sure that the compute power is there, making sure that the ability to manage the network that's collecting and addressing these, you know, hundreds of thousands and then millions of devices, all those devices have IP addresses. All of them have configurations. All those configurations need to be managed, um, changed, protected, et cetera, from a security standpoint. So from an IoT point of view, there's, you know, lots to be done. But we're very early days, and uh, you know, again, that's this is a you know a multi-year, decade-plus type of uh, activity that is going to just be pervasive uh, as we move forward. So, in its evolution, absolutely early days, uh, beginning of the curve. All right, Michael. Uh, thanks, Rob. So we started tracking IoT about the last two years. Every quarter, Q Advisors uh, produces a heat map of what's hot and what's not. And you can look at that on our website at qllc.com. And it's been interesting to see the evolution just in the last two years. You have some asset tracking going on in the, uh, the folks who are deploying next-gen uh, wireless systems to airplanes in addition to having the consumers driving the bandwidth 
uh, as, as Mark mentioned, that the, uh, the diagnostics on airplane usage, fuel efficiency, that is all IO2. So there is, there is a lot of movement. Effectively, it's still a mobile network, right? And once 5G comes around, IoT will accelerate. But there's the negative part of it, too. I'll give you a funny example. We were watching uh, TV last week at home, and there, a commercial for Alexa comes on. And the guy says, Alexa. And the Alexa in my house started talking. <laughs> and so my wife... My wife was like, we have got to get rid of this thing. It's spying on us. And there are people, both in the commercial and the residential consumer sector, that are fearful of this stuff. Um, and so there's got to be a better security mechanism, and we'll talk about that with our predictions for 2018. Right. Well, if I could just add one more thing to what Michael was talking about on that. Um, so with respect to IoT, you know, all these millions of devices are generating a ton of data as well. And one of the fields or, or ancillary fields uh, with respect to IoT that some people aren't thinking about is all the analytics. So decisions are made, um, you know, automation is uh, incorporated. And uh, one of the topics I, I was going to try to work into here was uh, some AI machine language type uh, activity. And if you're looking at all the, really the pure data that, that an IoT deployment creates uh, in any environment. It's, it's literally uh, petabytes and attabytes of, of data, and all that needs to be sifted through in, in some form. And, you know, as we sit here, there are, you know, a couple of firms that do this on a day-to-day -day basis as part of their livelihood, but the bottom line is that all of these analytics and ways to sift through them are going to need some form of AI to make heads or tails out of the you know immense amount of uh, data these things are throwing off. So that's just something that uh, I think throughout this year and, and moving forward is going to be a major trend in the business as well. Great, thank you. Um, in you know, shifting gears again, in the world of network security, uh, where do you think we see the threats coming from in 2018, and do we have who has the upper hand this year? Is it you know that, the the hacker side or is it the the, the network security guys? Uh, Chris, it's really uh, a, you know network security is a little, a little outside of our, our purview what we we try to do, um, but you know from my own personal views, it, it's just it, it's coming from everywhere, and with IoT, um, uh, these devices could be hackable as well. Uh, it, it's really going to be more and more difficult uh, to protect from. In, in fact, uh, I heard something uh, a while back by one of the industry pundits, uh, basically you know, a couple of three years ago, and I think this holds true today. What he was saying was that you you, you can no longer try to build uh, a network to stop uh, folks from getting in and hacking and penetrating the network or, or the, the computer. Uh, what you really have to do is figure out you know, mitigation and, and how to, uh, you know, assuming that there, there's going to be, folks are going to be able to penetrate uh, and you have to figure out how you handle it when it happens because it's going to happen. Uh, so I think this is going to become the, like the new normal and you know, be more with us than, uh, than be able to be prevented going forward. Right. Mark? Yeah, totally agree with uh, those comments. Um, you know, with respect to, you know, where we see uh, some of these uh, issues in security, um, you know, when, when you deploy an SD-WAN network, obviously, you know, people are looking for security there. Since it's an overlay network, you're looking for VPNs and, and things of that nature, which are encryption. But, you know, obviously, networks can be hacked. What you try to do is uh, minimize the damage once someone's in or... Uh, as you know, some of our uh, technology partners are moving towards uh, the concept of the zero trust network, and what that try attempts to do is, you know, basically as as the name sounds, um, no matter what you see, there is zero trust, and there are different ways of securing that network, whether it's session based or other other methodologies. Um, that's at least you know one form of protection one can use, uh, you know, inside uh, of a network. Um, with respect to you know who's uh, you know where are the threats coming from. You know, all, all points. I mean, vector, threat vectors come from many different areas, uh, whether it's, you know, state actors who are looking to steal, you know, the latest plans on the, uh, you know, F-22 to, uh, you know, taking down our, um, you know, utilities networks, you know, things of that nature. All those things need to be hardened and, uh, 
you know, fortunately, people are aware of the problem. Unfortunately, there's a lot of inertia in uh, putting the capital expenditures necessary to protect that critical infrastructure. And hopefully, uh, our you know our smart leaders in Washington will will try to figure that one out and, and make the utilities do something. But uh, you know, no one wants to see lights out, literally. So there are a lot of different threat vectors. Um, they will be continuous. They will be ongoing, and uh, it's something that, of course, isn't going to stop. But to the extent that we can protect ourselves with respect to, um, you know, different methodologies, um, you know, can't change human nature. Anyone who clicks on the ransomware attachment on the email, you know, it's very hard to protect against that. So, uh, again, it's more of, uh, you know, knowing what the threat vectors are, trying to protect to the extent that you can, uh, trying to put, you know, whatever that penetration is in a box, whether it's containerized applications or what have you, uh, a lot of different ways to do it, but, uh, you know, it ain't going away, as they say. So, all right, Michael. Well, I think uh, look when you had the, uh, the the amount of hacking that we had with financial institutions and uh, services that are supposed to protect people's identities last year, that's been a big wake up call. And I think what you're seeing is is two things developing. One is a more aggressive threat management uh, protocol at a lot of our carrier clients, um, and in some sense, using what banks do. And so oftentimes, you can now opt in and get it when you're on your financial institution's website, you can get a text message per, you know, putting in an access code. And some of our clients are looking how to deploy that similar thing when folks access into the network from their end user clients. Uh, I see, I think we're seeing a lot more encryption. We've got a, a client, an infrastructure as a service client, Coligo, and they're based in the Isle of Jersey, and their their big uh, advantage over a lot of their customers, a lot of their competitors, is that they have encryption into the network while it's in the the, the cloud, and then back out to the client. So this this need for encryption is 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 really really important, um, and so I think you're going to see a lot of more active network management, and that's going to result in opportunities for startups who are going to be able to deploy technology that carriers, whether they're wireless or fiber providers, uh, are going to need. So that's predictions time. Can each of you give us a, a concrete prediction something of something that you think we should expect to see this year in the world of networks and technology, and why, why should we be watching that? Uh, Cliff? Uh, under the gun, huh? Okay. So uh, this year is, you know, from a network perspective, is almost over, right? It's, it's January, so you know, the network plans are done, capital budgets are all being deployed. Um, so I think you're going to see a lot more uh, small cell um, uh, sites be uh, figured out in terms of uh, fiber will be acquired for them or built for them. Uh, the real estate will be acquired, uh, and the uh, the um, you know, the infrastructure and the, that that's required to um, to support um, you know small large small cell networks and the beginnings of densification will start rolling into play. Uh, specifically, you know the hoteling, edge hoteling, and which I think you know is 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 another way to say uh, uh, smart uh, edge data centers, uh, and that's what we're we're building upon that, uh, but I think right now you're, you're actually seeing uh, capital being deployed for it. Uh, you'll see a continuation of that throughout the year as we ramp up into uh, into this, this whole new uh, world of densification. And, and one uh, point about that, and, and just directionally, uh, when we think about it, uh, we, we, we've heard a couple of, uh, of metaphors for, for 5G uh, in that, um, being, being compared to the advent of electricity, uh, the internet, uh, it's it's going to be a um, a game changing technology in so many ways because you'll be providing so much bandwidth to the end users, uh, and there'll be so much more mobility, and then of course the IoT um, applications coming into play for for quality of life. Uh, but I think this year you'll see uh, a lot more capital spend on on the broader um, uh, small cell network and, and infrastructure deployments. Hey, Mark. Okay, Cliff, you stole a lot of my. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. 
<laughs> it's all good. Um, so yeah, with respect to you know the coming year, obviously fiber densification has been you know a hot topic, and you know builds continue. Um, I believe that SD WAN will continue to pervade um, the the enterprise environment as well as into the uh, service provider environment. Meaning, um, a lot of MSPs will pop up to provide the service, but I think a lot of uh, enterprises will also take it upon their own to um, adjust their wide area networks and and use this technology. And it's not really just for the network's sake. It's really going to be more to tune um, how an application acts on the network. So if I need to do a hybridization of my, my inside world versus my cloud world, SD-WAN is a really good tool to do that. So I think you'll see a lot more of that going on. Um, the other piece uh, we talked a, a few times about during this session is uh, edge computing. I think that will, um, regardless of how fast or not 5G uh, evolves and is deployed, I believe that edge computing will continue to uh, be looked at, deployed, uh, tuned, if you will, uh, and worked more and more into uh, folks' day-to-day uh, -day, uh, networking activity, meaning from an uh, application provider or managed service provider perspective. Uh, edge Connects and other folks like that doing this all the time. Um, the other trend I think will uh, definitely take off in the year is uh, serverless computing and uh, the use of containerization. Uh, that's something that obviously has been being used in the last year or two, but I think uh, in the next year or so it should really start to accelerate as folks see the benefits of that from a uh, capex and operational expenditure perspective. Um, the other trend is uh, much more uh, ephemeral, and that is uh, the transition more from physical networking devices to virtual networking devices and the use of white box and network functions virtualization uh, to be able to uh, plant different virtual network functions uh, on demand at different customer prems. Uh, again, there are carriers who are already doing that. I believe that uh, 5G will help uh, drive that as far as the bandwidth and the fiber that's being laid in the ground to accommodate the speeds and other uh, performance necessary to do that. Uh, as far as latency and, and things of that nature, but you'll see those trends moving as well. Uh, and then the two I just have is kind of throwaways. I believe the, uh, the stock market will go up during 2018 at some point, and I think we will have the same president in the White House at some point in 2018. So I think I can take both, at least a couple of those to the bank moving forward. Some bold predictions there. <laughs> very bold, very bold, but I don't think you're talking about the tech ones either. <laughs> Michael? All right, well, I'll come at it from a different perspective, kind of the investment banking perspective. I think you're going to see a lot more fiber consolidation. In fact, all of our fiber clients seem to be for sale, and everybody else in the market for sale. So, Cliff, I don't know if you guys are for sale, but I'm <laughs> going to call after, after this. But uh, so I think you're going to see a lot of a lot of fiber consolidation, for one, um, because of, of the scale. I think you're going to start to see a lot of the fiber providers starting to offer more dark fiber. Zayo historically, for example, has never offered dark fiber, and now they came out yesterday and said that they're big pro-dark fiber folks. So that's kind of interesting. I think on the, the fixed wireless side, you're going to see a lot more uh, competitive buys. We just uh, have under LOI three of our fixed wireless clients selling now. That used to be a pariah in the telecom industry. Um, and now carriers, wireless guys for backhaul, fiber folks to supplement their own reach. So you're going to see a lot more activity in the fixed wireless space. In the managed service space, I believe that all of these large UCAS companies will be bought this year. Ring Central, Vonage, 8x8. And they're going to be bought by people that none of us expect to buy. Uh, and I think that's going to be interesting. Uh, my, my other predictions are a little more uh, out there. I think Roger Federer will win two out of the four Grand Slams this year. The Jets still will not be in the Super Bowl. Oh. <laughs> I think that one's pretty safe. <laughs> well, thank you, everybody. And I'll turn it back over to Jamie here. Yes, and thank you, gentlemen. Uh, we've heard so many uh, great, bold uh, predictions, everything from edge hoteling, edge computing, fiber densification, SD-WANs, M&As. Um, presidencies, uh, Super Bowl wins. Uh, so um, thank you very much for your predictions. Um, and again, our all-star panelists, Cliff Kane of Clarion, Mark Balafia of DataVision, and Michael Crane of Q Advisors. 
And of course, our guest moderator today, Mr. Rob Powell of Telecom Ramblings. This wraps up our last, our latest virtual CEO roundtable. And go ahead and meet Rob in person, as well as many of our panelists here and our JSA team, June 20th, Telecom Exchange, Hoboken, New Jersey. To feature your C-level here next time, go ahead and email us, pr at jsa.net. Thanks for tuning in to JSA TV, the newsroom for tech and telecom professionals, and JSA Radio, your voice for tech and telecom on iHeartRadio. Happy networking.